Hi, I'm Steve Morocco. Uh, who here would like a $5, 10 minute, regardless of weather, trip to Denver? <laughs> me too, me too. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's sort of the motivating driving force here. This is what we're looking at eventually. This is a long-term plan, and you guys may have heard of it in the news. The general concept is called Hyperloop, and it is a public transit system that's in a vacuum tube. It's car-sized capsules that you can call like Uber on your phone, and then for $5, you can get to Denver in 10 minutes, regardless of weather. It's a pretty cool thing. So uh, when I present this idea to people or have meetings with the city or whatever, uh, there are four questions that usually come up, so I'm going to answer those for you today. Uh, how safe is this? <laughs> Will it be super scary? Um, is it real? Is it actually going to happen? Or is this just you know, a map that someone drew in Photoshop that's not going to happen? Um, uh, when is it going to happen? And who's paying for it? Uh, so I'll answer those four questions in the four minutes that I have here. I've just learned that I have six minutes, actually. So I'm going to take, <laughs> take my time. Uh, so first of all, is it safe? Uh, the first thing I want to emphasize is that this technology, we're looking at actually getting it built and having it be one of the safest forms of transit that's ever existed. So when you think about airplanes, you're in a metal tube flying through the sky, and that's not super reassuring. And that was actually one of the major problems in getting airplanes off the ground, so to speak, uh, initially, 100 years ago, is that they were very scary for people, and people didn't, it didn't feel like a familiar concept to fly in a metal tube high above the ground. So. Uh, They've made that one of the safest transportation systems in the world just because of necessity, right? For the public to accept that it, it needed to be very safe. And this is going to be much the same way, except that you're not in a metal tube flying 40,000 feet in the air. Uh, and there are ways to get out of the tube should emergencies happen and that sort of thing. So it's actually going to be one of the safest forms of transit that we have. We've already lost, uh, I think, six or 800 people on the roads in Colorado just this year. Uh, and that is like an active and ongoing tragedy every single day. So the faster we can move to a form of public transit that is super safe like this, I think the better off we'll be. So a lot of the concerns that come up about safety, I just want to assuage those concerns right off the bat. Second question is, is this real? Uh, yes. So surprisingly, it is real. Uh, what got me involved in the first place is I helped out with a live stream that a company called SpaceX does in LA. And they have a student competition going on where university teams from all over the country will come and compete in LA. And there were, there were actually high school students in this competition who were building Hyperloop pods and getting the technology demonstrated. So that inspired me to come back here to Colorado Springs and start asking around, why aren't we commercializing this technology? Why aren't we building it? What is happening here? If there are high school students building this thing. Why, don't we, why can't I get to Denver in five minutes for $5? Uh, so the, the city answered that question with a resounding uh, we don't know why, but if it can be done, let's do it, uh, which I was phenomenally happy to, to find out that Colorado Springs would be very supportive of it. And I had just coincidentally met a company out of Fort Collins called Loop Global. That's their logo there uh, on the slide. And they were looking for right-of-way and investment to be able to build here in Colorado. And so this sort of two different parties that didn't know about each other, I've just played connecting force and set up meetings between them. And, it's looking like we're going to be able to build here in, in Colorado Springs. Now, Loop is also looking at a couple other cities. And you know wherever it's easiest and simplest and a biggest win for them to build, they'll build. But I'm working very hard to make sure that the, the easiest place for them to build is Colorado Springs. So hopefully, mid-2018, they'll get to start construction. There'll be a big press release and announcement of the partnership and that sort of thing. Uh, so very, very soon is when they'll begin construction. What it's looking like is a three-mile test track. Uh, so the third question is, when is this happening? Uh, 2018, and then we're going to be open to the public in 2020 or 2021, and that will be a three-mile test track that's a demonstration of the technology, sort of an exploration of the history of tube transit. Uh, for example, it was invented by a guy named Robert Goddard, who also came up with the concept of orbiting, which some of you may be familiar with, which people also thought was a pie-in-the-sky sort of impossible idea. Sending a spaceship around the world didn't sound very possible. Neither does tube transit, but it's going to happen. Uh, so we'll have some of that history of Robert Goddard and tube transit over the last hundred years, Elon Musk's white paper and that sort of thing, in a demonstration of urban developed integration with the city from UCCS to downtown. We're working with some of the best uh, infrastructure engineers in the world to make sure that this is a good thing for Colorado Springs. There'll be park and placemaking efforts to make sure that this is similar to the Atlanta Beltline or New York High Line in terms of green spaces and open places for people to just be around this new technology and really feel like it's a part of our city in a good way. Um, and then the final question I usually get is, who's going to pay for it? 
So many of you who've seen the news of Hyperloop uh, have heard perhaps that there's a company called Hyperloop One that's trying to build a $24 billion uh, public transit system that looks a lot like this uh, in partnership with CDOT, and they're building a feasibility study right now. Hyperloop One's costs are much higher than loops because they're building much bigger tubes. The cost of the tube increases as like a cube of the diameter. So we're looking at five foot diameter tubes for loop that'll fit a car sized, minivan sized capsule. It's just like sitting in a minivan. Whereas Hyperloop wants to put your entire car or entire shipping containers in their tubes. It's much more expensive and they want to fund it with taxpayer money. $24 billion, just to give you a sense of scale, is about a third of the total budget the US spends on public transit in a year right now, which is nuts. <laughs> Uh, what we want to do is privately fund the whole thing, the whole, uh, at least Colorado Springs to Denver, at least that part of it, and possibly the entire front range. So most definitely the Colorado Springs route open in 2021 will be privately funded. The route to Denver and DIA from Colorado Springs will be privately funded as well, and that'll be open hopefully around 2025. So, questions? Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? Okay, yeah. So uh, the, the concept of Hyperloop generally, as it has been popularized, is more of like a train idea. So people are familiar with like, oh, we'd have a Colorado Springs stop and a Denver stop, and that makes sense. Uh, but there's an opportunity, especially when you're building with smaller tubes like Loop is, to really integrate it with the city in the same way that a metro would be integrated, except that the metro also leaves town at high speed. <laughs> uh, so we're looking at stops at UCCS, downtown, possibly the Broadmoor, Manitou, Northern Colorado Springs, a couple of the like Air Force and Army bases. Uh, and there's an opportunity to build all of those stops just like you'd have exits on a freeway. And then when you call a loop capsule with your phone, you would go direct to your destination instead of stopping along the way or waiting for the train to slow down and people to get off. And you're ha you have a six person capsule that goes direct to where you're going. Uh, go for it. I'm just curious about your background. Can you yeah. share a little bit about Kind of your journey to this sure. I am extremely qualified to do this. I have a degree in photography. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like I said, the way I got involved was helping out. So I run a media company. I fly drones around for people usually. Uh, I suppose you could just call me a photographer, but I use drones mostly for my photography. And I was helping with this live stream in LA and just wanted to ask questions and see if Colorado Springs was thinking about it. Did not expect to get into transit development as a hobby, but uh, it's been very fun. And my role here is because the company's based in Fort Collins right now, and they're not gonna move to the Springs until they have permission to build and money raised and all that. That'll be later next year. In the meantime, I'm setting up all their meetings and making sure to run interference here in Colorado Springs to make things easy for them. So in that way, I'm tangentially involved, but I'm not like on their staff or anything. And what's the website for the company? Uh, loopglobalinc.com. Uh, I'll run through some of the slides here. There's a picture of what a capsule will look like. There's the tubes and sort of the size we're looking at. You can have pallets and such things in the tubes. Uh, there's a little illustration of what it might look like. This is Fillmore, if you're looking at here. Uh, and Weber and Shook's run in the background. So this is above ground or on the We're looking at above ground for uh, the first three mile test track. It might be underground. Here's a comparison of what some of the other companies are doing. Like that people one. Mm -hmm. This one? Yeah. There you go. That's a fun one to share to Facebook if you need to. Okay, other questions? Yeah. What, what's the rider experience going to be like? Uh, I'm particularly motion sick. Yes. So, so, so tell us how it works. the ride experience will be so, for reference, you're traveling 14,000 miles per hour right now around the sun. You just don't really notice it because there's not reference of like things flying by at 14,000 miles an hour. Uh, if you've ever ridden a high-speed train, the TGV in Europe or, or something similar, you've looked out the window and been like, oh no, I should not have looked out the window. <laughs> so people are worried about there not being windows, but to be honest, having a big screen TV and a comfy seat is probably going to be a pretty good way to go, 1,200 miles per hour. Uh, this will probably just feel like sitting in your living room. And then the f initial acceleration will be like getting on the interstate. So it'll be a much more familiar experience than you would expect of 1,200 miles per hour in a vacuum tube. Yes. Is the cost when you say $5 to get, is that per person? 
assuming six people, or is that? Yeah, per person. So because of the way this technology works, their margins are incredible. You're using about a dollar of energy to get up to speed at 800 miles per hour. They're using some incredible maglev technology that gets this done. And then you get 90 cents of that back when you slow down, the same way the Tesla recharges its batteries when you step on the brake. And so you're spending 10 cents to get someone to Denver, which changes the entire transportation game. So, so they're planning on reducing costs over time. So it'll start so at $5 and it'll go down from there. That's the initial it's just the infrastructure cost. Infrastructure and maintenance, yeah. Pretty, pretty low margin. And the, even that's about half the cost of an interstate lane. So pretty affordable per mile. I was just showing that. How, okay. how does the service play dramatic for um, It is much cheaper, mile for mile. High speed trains are $400 million a mile, and this is 10 to $15 million a mile, depending on the train. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a lot faster. High speed trains are maybe 300 miles per hour, best case scenario, and this is 1,200, which is about four times that. And twice Hyperloop 1, what they're proposing. Yes? For women that are pregnant or people that have pacemakers mm -hmm. or heart problems or something uh, You are far enough away from the magnet tracks that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, it's not going to be an issue for computers or pacemakers, phones, that sort of thing. Uh, pretty neutral environment. And all the levitation is passive. So if the power goes out, whatever, not an issue, you'd continue to your destination, slow down and stop. All passively. Yes? Can you describe the coordination efforts that are going to be necessary with other forms of public transportation, like having bus stops near yes. taxi stands? So actually, like that? that's the fun part of what we're working on with the city of Colorado Springs. There's this North Nevada corridor that the city actually suggested to us instead of us going to them. Uh, it's between Fillmore and Garden of the Gods, and we're thinking of extending down Weber since they're redeveloping Weber here soon and up to UCCS for a research facility. But the whole idea of that track of land initially was a transportation research sort of innovation corridor where there'd be bus routes and bike lanes and a park area. And then this five foot right of way tube will just be a part of that. So it takes up very little space and it's above ground. Uh, and it, it looks pretty nice too. It's gonna be really beautifully made. But do they, you have to coordinate with having bus stops moved and things like that move so they're near? So yeah, people get so there would be integration with the various stops. When you get off of a trip to Denver, you'd be right around a bus station with bus stops to get you in the city. We're also talking with Colorado Springs about building a PRT, a personal rapid transit system that's not buses, that would be cheaper and easier and faster uh, to implement and to use and quieter than buses here in Colorado Springs. Bit of a long-term goal. But. How would this coordinate with this idea of a board machine? Yes. And why wouldn't you consider that? So there is a good chance that Musk may roll into town and, and start boring for us or in collaboration with Loop. Um, he's also interested in doing some of his own technology. And we actually met with one of Elon's former right hands, who's now a dean at, at CU Boulder a couple weeks ago, asked him that same question. Like, is Elon going to show up and compete with us? Like, what is his angle here? Uh, and Elon is just really enthusiastic about the technology. He's promised Tesla and SpaceX investors that he will try to get on in, try to stay uninvolved, and he's failing at that. <laughs> uh, but his, his enthusiasm is, let's get this built as, as fast as possible. So I think he's going to be enthusiastic about helping whoever is getting it built. Yes? Uh, what about the Colorado Springs Airport? Theoretically, this would make it not necessary. Colorado Springs Airport, I think, will be connected to the system, and there will still be a place for airports, right? We're not competing with airports or with train routes, compete a little bit with cars, but I, this is an entirely different class of transportation for things that are super urgent commercially or you know people who want to get somewhere fast. Uh, so there will definitely still be a place for airports and we don't see anything happening other than just more people being able to get to the Colorado Springs airport quicker uh, because you'll have a f like two minute trip from downtown Colorado Springs to the airport, which will be really nice. Um, and, and like I said, multiple stops in the city, so we'll be able to integrate really well with the airport. Yeah, you could do either. Exactly. So, yeah. It seems like the time spent is going to be waiting and getting on and off the, the, the tube. Right. Which, it, I, I, that's a, something that they share with uh, airports during your travel. You're just waiting and waiting. Oh, yeah. But I see the log jams happening there. Yes. Is that a, a part, part of the reason that Loop is uh, really dedicated to building multiple different uh, entry and exit points is exactly that problem, right? We don't want to have one big Grand Central Station where, you know, this part of Colorado Springs is closer to parts of Denver than other parts of Colorado Springs. Um, we want to have multiple different entry and access points all over town 
that make the entire city uh, able to access this system and go to Denver very quickly, and Denver to get to us very quickly. So you have to have a TSA type of anti-terrorist uh, sort of some Probably not. Yeah, I mean, the same risk exists with interstates, right? Someone could blow it up, and then all the grocery stores in Colorado Springs would be shut down in the next two days. And that's a single point of failure that's super risky. Uh, so this would actually just duplicate that, and we'd make our transportation system in general much safer. I don't know that there will be an immediate need for a TSA-like thing. I don't think that would be fun for anyone. How do, these, how do these pods merge? Because you have pods traveling through the tube, and probably billions of miles an hour. Yes. Right? Exactly how 5 billion, do you, billion miles. How do you get Yes, so if you think of warp speed as the interstate and then sort of your entry and access portals as uh, roads and alleys in town, it's the same thing as a road network, right, where you've got these metaphorical roads and alleys and avenues that go into town and s disperse people throughout the local area, and then you've got a main backbone that's the high-speed route. So you're accelerating up to the speed of the main backbone and then merging on using just local tubes. And then you have this main tube that's always, the capsules on it are always traveling to full and speed. So then the integration of spacing and things so that you don't rear end the tube or whatever. Right. All automated, automated, all computer timed. So yeah. sitting in a terminal going No. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody is driving the, yeah, we'll make sure that's all computer control. Yes? Have you thought about how this will impact plans to widen I-25? I actually just talked to the AECOM team that will be widening I-25 last week at a CDOT conference. And I was like, listen, while you guys are widening it, would you please throw in a fourth lane? Just, I know you only are supposed to build three, but just throw in a fourth. Uh, and they were like, we'll try. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Uh, I, I think there's still, like I said, there's a place for interstates and, and airports and that sort of thing. And that project is still going to happen. Like, that is important for us to widen that section of I-25. It's been 50 years in the making, right? I don't think this is going to stop that, but it will complement it. Uh, you mentioned that there's a few other cities that we're competing against. Yes. So who are those cities, and if, if, they, if one of those got it, does that mean we won't have one? Uh, for sure. I think it would mean that we get it a little bit later. Uh, the founder, D. Worthington, is originally from Kansas City, and he just met with Kansas City's mayor a couple months ago, and that lit the fire under my butt to make sure meetings here in Colorado Springs were happening as fast as possible. Uh, things are looking good there, too. And to be honest, I am just all for the commercialization of it and want it to happen as fast as possible. Um, but we're we're pretty far ahead here in Colorado Springs. Like, we're at a, a really advanced stage with the conversation with Colorado Springs, and we're pretty confident that we'll be able to get it landed here. And when is that decision made? A decision will be made uh, collaboratively with the city and city council and the public over the course of the next few months, making sure it's a public process. The whole area is bought in, and everybody loves what we're building. So we're in the process of doing visual preference surveys to make sure the community is involved in designing the system and making sure it looks beautiful when it's built, that sort of stuff. So once the public process is all through and city council has seen it, mayor loves it, everybody's on board, and papers are signed, then construction will begin. Yeah? So um, being somebody who lives in an area that you're yes, talking about, exactly. we're going to be looking for people who live in that area and get their feedback? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we want you guys to collaboratively design this with us. What does it mean for your neighborhood? What sort of stops do you want? Where do you want them? It's also quieter than power lines, which is really nice. It's not going to be like, <laughs> like Jetson's style, super scary yeah. noises. None of that. Yes. Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. In, in long term, there's an opportunity for tunneling. So, you know, I, we'll have that discussion interactively with the community over the course of the next few months. Do you know if they're going to be contacting the neighbors? Yes. That will all be happening. There will be a public process just like the North Nevada uh, transportation plan that happened. Yeah. So if you were involved in that at all, it'll be very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So uh, one would imagine the tube getting punctured and then everything going horribly wrong. It's actually not what happens. You, you just sort of up the vacuum pumps uh, running a little bit more often uh, until the tube gets repaired. And because it's an internal uh, lack of pressure, you can just repa repair it from the outside. You can just patch it so you don't have to get in the tube and try to fix it with a capsule that's stopped. And you don't even have to stop the flow of traffic. You just turn the vacuum pumps on and then fix it an hour later and you're good to go. It's a pretty cool system, yeah. So these like a pre-made, 
tube that's then just put together, is that what it is? Exactly. Just, uh, mm -hmm. And the cool thing about what Loop is doing is they're using uh, existing capacity from companies that have built pipelines and so forth. So you're, you're not turning on a whole new industry and figuring out how to build hundreds of miles of a thing that's never been built before. There are pipelines that have been built in, in this scale pretty cheaply, and they're going to do essentially the same thing using the same tools. So it's just a matter of contracting out to people who already know how to build it, which is fun. Yes? So, so in the I-25 corridor question, um, if this can go underground, mm -hmm. why would you need four lanes if you could put it under the third lane? So we wouldn't be building on interstate right away. That is a possibility, right? Uh, and, and we're looking at that possibility. BNSF has also talked with us briefly about the possibility of using their right of way. Uh, but if we want a 1,200 mile per hour, very, very straight right of way to Denver, that's going to involve some private land and some. And because this is such a high margin system, there are opportunities for paying back landowners if we use their land, paying their mortgage, that sort of thing. So uh, there, there are some conversations to be had about what the final commercial route will look like. but. Uh, interstate land, we wouldn't use the interstate specifically. We'd sort of average the corners of the interstate right of way, which is about a 100 foot area, and it would either go above or below that. All of that conversation is still a couple years out. So it could be above the three lanes as well as below the three lanes yep. and not encourage on other means of the car. Exactly. What are the maintenance, and how many people does it take to maintain something? To be clear, when I was joking about the fourth lane thing, I was just saying they should add a fourth lane because we need. Four lanes for cars. I wasn't referring to a lane for the Hyperloop project. Yeah. What about the maintenance? The magnet. How many people does it take to run a business like this from here to Denver or whatever? What are your a team, team of a couple hundred or a couple thousand. And I think that's why it's going to be a great win for Colorado Springs if this company bases themselves here. Because they're going to be building this system all over the country eventually. And so having them based out of Colorado Springs and doing their first project here will be a great win for our community. There's an Air Force base that owns that owns that part of I-25. They're actually leasing it to the Highway Administration, which is interesting. Uh, I don't think they're national parks. There might be a few state parks, but yeah, the conversation there is all with the FHWA and CDOT. And yeah, those conversations have already sort of started, but none of them are concrete until we have the thing built and we know exactly what it looks like. <laughs> so they're using pipeline technology. I assume a lot of pipelines are self-monitored. Sure. So that's already. He's already known how to under, understand each so many inches of the pipe and whether or not it's in good condition and so forth. Yeah, their their strategy is very similar, a little a little more involved than pipelines, but pretty similar technologies if you're familiar. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. This is the twenty four billion that they gave What's your thought? Uh, about six and hopefully privately funded, right? So the track from here to Denver is gonna be under a billion dollars. And just for reference, we spent a full $6 billion on the light rail that goes to DIA, right? Which under 1% of the population of Colorado uses. So uh, <laughs> we think there will be plenty of private capital here in Colorado that wants to build this $6 billion system, considering it's a fifth of the cost of what's being considered with public funds. We think it's a pretty big win and we're excited to get that built. And that sort of work, so the precedent we're drawing from there is Carl Fisher, the guy who built the first highway across the US, got private checks from Edison, Roosevelt, uh, and a bunch of car companies to build this first highway with private money. And that proved out the system and then uh, Eisenhower came in 20 years later. He rode on this highway when he was 20. That inspired him to make the interstate highway system as a like defense project when he was president. So that precedent works for us too, right? Let's prove it out with private funds and then let's let the public worry about it afterward. Yeah? What is the uh, people capacity of the system compared to highways and trains? Okay, this is gonna sound ridiculous, but because you have capsules that are the size of a minivan traveling at 600 miles an hour, or 800 or 1200, you're looking at like a 40 lane highway in terms of capacity in a two lane tube or two tube system. So you're in very few places in the world where you, will you need more than two tubes, like maybe Beijing, Shanghai, but, but you can fit a ton of people, more people than will ever travel between Colorado Springs and Denver in just the two tubes. Wow. You can move a lot of people, exactly, yeah. We have time for one more question before the final question. 
Can you go to your next slide because you had like a, net, like a comparison there. Yeah, we've got a couple good slides here. Sorry, like, I haven't been very why, good about why the, through them. You know, why have the other groups chosen the larger versus, is there any, any idea behind that? Uh, many of their first investors are vested interests in the transportation game. Elon, for example, has a fiduciary duty to make sure that cars are not replaced because he's a pretty big Tesla shareholder. <laughs> uh, and, you know, that's fine. And I think there are probably uses for these systems. They're just super expensive. And I think there'll be more specialty like ports and, you know, near places that cars need to get out of traffic, that sort of thing. In the case of LA, Elon tunneling and putting cars in those tunnels is a great thing. Uh, but in Colorado, I think it makes really great sense. And in a lot of places in the world, it makes great sense to have a system that you can build worldwide that's super cheap, transit, transportation infrastructure-wise, like, like a five-foot diameter tube for a big, large-scale system. Whereas these, like, that, that situation there, you're not going to want to build that very far, 250 million miles. Yeah. Final question. Our special question. What can we as a community do to help you? Uh, well, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, the, the ask here is pretty easy for you guys. I would just like you guys to talk positively about this. There's a Gazette article that came out today, perfect timing, uh, by a journalist named Rachel who's Incredible, she's been interviewing the founders of the company and really diving in deep to just some quality journalism uh, into the company and into some of the other projects that are happening here in Colorado and finding out what the real story there is. Would highly recommend you read what she's writing. But uh, in her article today it says, public support is going to be key to making this project happen. And that's very true. When we have these conversations, part of the reason I started my pitch with the safety of the system is because the first thing that comes to people's mind is safety and terrorism, or you know, I'm gonna be claustrophobic in the tube, how do I handle that? or you know, these things that obviously uh, this company has thought a lot about and they're gonna make sure aren't really issues. So if instead of, is it, will it be safe? Can we get a TSA? Like, I'm not gonna pay for this with my own tax dollars. Instead of those conversations, I would just ask that you guys as a community have conversations about how cool this is, how great it's gonna be to pay $5 to go to Denver in 10 minutes when it's snowing, and how much you want it to happen, because those conversations are gonna get it built. Thank you.